part two section seventeen of the main woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part two chesuncook section seventeen there may be some truth in what he said about the moose growing larger formerly for the quaint john jocelyn a physician who spent many years in this very district of maine in the seventeenth century says that the tips of their horns are sometimes found to be two fathoms asunder and he is particular to tell us that a fathom is six feet and they are in height from the toe of the forefoot to the pitch of the shoulder twelve foot both which hath been taken by some of my sceptic readers to be monstrous lies and he adds there are certain transcendentia in every creature which are the indelible character of god and which discover god this is a greater dilemma to be caught in than is presented by the cranium of the young bechuana ox apparently another of the transcendentia in the collection of thomas steele upper brook street london whose entire length of horn from tip to tip along the curve is thirteen feet five inches distance straight between the tips of the horns eight feet eight and a half inches however the size both of the moose and the cougar as i have found is generally rather underrated than overrated and i should be inclined to add to the popular estimate a part of what i subtracted from jocelyn's but we talked mostly with the governor's son-in-law a very sensible indian and the governor being so old and deaf permitted himself to be ignored while we asked questions about him the former said that there were two political parties among them one in favour of schools and the other opposed to them or rather they did not wish to resist the priest who was opposed to them the first had just prevailed at the election and sent their man to the legislature neptune and Aetion and himself were in favour of schools he said if indians got learning they would keep their money when we asked where joe's father Aetion was he knew that he must be at lincoln though he was about to go a moose hunting for a messenger had just gone to him there to get his signature to some papers i asked neptune if they had any of the old breed of dogs yet he answered yes but that said i pointing to one that had just come in is a yankee dog he assented i said that he did not look like a good one oh yes he said and he told with much gusto how the year before he had caught and held by the throat a wolf a very small black puppy rushed into the room and made at the governor's feet as he sat in his stockings with his legs dangling from the bedside the governor rubbed his hands and dared him to come on entering into the sport with spirit nothing more that was significant transpired to my knowledge during this interview this was the first time that i ever called on a governor but as i did not ask for an office i can speak of it with the more freedom an indian who was making canoes behind a house looking up pleasantly from his work for he knew my companion said that his name was old john pennyweight i had heard of him long before and i inquired after one of his contemporaries joe fourpence halfpenny but alas he no longer circulates i made a faithful study of canoe building and i thought that i should like to serve an apprenticeship at that trade for one season going into the woods for bark with my boss making the canoe there and returning in it at last while the bateau was coming over to take us off i picked up some fragments of arrow-heads on the shore and one broken stone chisel which were greater novelties to the indians than to me after this on old fort hill at the bend of the penobscot three miles above bangor looking for the site of an indian town which some think stood thereabouts i found more arrow-heads and two little dark and crumbling fragments of indian earthenware in the ashes of their fires the indians on the island appeared to live quite happily and to be well treated by the inhabitants of old town we visited vesey's mills just below the island where were sixteen sets of saws some gang saws sixteen in a gang not to mention circular saws on one side they were hauling the logs up an inclined plane by water power on the other passing out the boards planks and sawed timber and forming them into rafts the trees were literally drawn and quartered there in forming the rafts they used the lower three feet of hardwood saplings which have a crooked and knobbed butt end for bolts passing them up through holes bored in the corners and sides of the rafts and keying them 
in another apartment they were making fence slats such as stand all over new england out of odds and ends and it may be that i saw where the picket fence behind which i dwell at home came from i was surprised to find a boy collecting the long edgings of boards as fast as cut off and thrusting them down a hopper where they were ground up beneath the mill that they might be out of the way otherwise they accumulate in vast piles by the side of the building increasing the danger from fire or floating off they obstruct the river this was not only a sawmill but a grist mill then the inhabitants of old town stillwater and bangor cannot suffer for want of kindling stuff surely some get their living exclusively by picking up the driftwood and selling it by the cord in the winter in one place i saw where an irishman who keeps a team and a man for the purpose had covered the shore for a long distance with regular piles and i was told that he had sold twelve hundred dollars worth in a year another who lived by the shore told me that he got all the material of his outbuildings and fences from the river and in that neighbourhood i perceived that this refuse wood was frequently used instead of sand to fill hollows with being apparently cheaper than dirt i got my first clear view of katahdin on this excursion from a hill about two miles northwest of bangor whither i went for this purpose after this i was ready to return to massachusetts humboldt has written an interesting chapter on the primitive forest but no one has yet described for me the difference between that wild forest which once occupied our oldest townships and the tame one which i find there to-day it is a difference which would be worth attending to the civilized man not only clears the land permanently to a great extent and cultivates open fields but he tames and cultivates to a certain extent the forest itself by his mere presence almost he changes the nature of the trees as no other creature does the sun and air and perhaps fire have been introduced and grain raised where it stands it has lost its wild damp and shaggy look the countless fallen and decaying trees are gone and consequently that thick coat of moss which lived on them is gone too the earth is comparatively bare and smooth and dry the most primitive places left with us are the swamps where the spruce still grows shaggy with usnea the surface of the ground in the main woods is everywhere spongy and saturated with moisture i notice that the plants which cover the forest floor there are such as are commonly confined to swamps with us the clintonia borealis orchises creeping snowberry and others and the prevailing aster there is the aster acuminatus which with us grows in damp and shady woods the asters cordifolius and macrophyllus also are common asters of little or no colour and sometimes without petals i saw no soft spreading second-growth white pines with smooth bark acknowledging the presence of the woodchopper but even the young white pines were all tall and slender rough-barked trees those main woods differ essentially from ours there you are never reminded that the wilderness which you are threading is after all some villager's familiar woodlot some widow's thirds from which her ancestors have sledded fuel for generations minutely described in some old deed which is recorded of which the owner has got a plan too and old bound marks may be found every forty rods if you will search tis true the map may inform you that you stand on land granted by the state to some academy or on bingham's purchase but these names do not impose on you for you see nothing to remind you of the academy or of bingham what were the forests of england to these one writer relates of the isle of wight that in charles the second's time there were woods in the island so complete and extensive that it is said a squirrel might have travelled in several parts many leagues together on the top of the trees if it were not for the rivers and he might go round their heads a squirrel could here travel thus the whole breadth of the country we have as yet had no adequate account of a primitive pine forest i have noticed that in a physical atlas lately published in massachusetts and used in our schools the woodland of north america is limited almost solely to the valleys of the ohio and some of the great lakes and the great pine forests of the globe are not represented in our vicinity for instance new brunswick and maine are exhibited as bare as greenland it may be that the children of greenville at the foot of moosehead lake who surely are not likely to be scared by an owl 
are referred to the valley of the ohio to get an idea of a forest but they would not know what to do with their moose bear caribou beaver etc there shall we leave it to an englishman to inform us that in north america both in the united states and canada are the most extensive pine forests in the world the greater part of new brunswick the northern half of maine and adjacent parts of canada not to mention the northeastern part of new york and other tracts farther off are still covered with an almost unbroken pine forest but maine perhaps will soon be where massachusetts is a good part of her territory is already as bare and commonplace as much of our neighbourhood and her villages generally are not so well shaded as ours we seem to think that the earth must go through the ordeal of sheep pasturage before it is habitable by man consider nahant the resort of all the fashion of boston which peninsula i saw but indistinctly in the twilight when i steamed by it and thought that it was unchanged since the discovery john smith described it in sixteen fourteen as the mattahunts two pleasant isles of groves gardens and cornfields and others tell us that it was once well wooded and even furnished timber to build the wharves of boston now it is difficult to make a tree grow there and the visitor comes away with a vision of mr tudor's ugly fences a rod high designed to protect a few pear shrubs and what are we coming to in our middlesex towns a bald staring town-house or meeting-house and a bare liberty pole as leafless as it is fruitless for all i can see we shall be obliged to import the timber for the last hereafter or splice such sticks as we have and our ideas of liberty are equally mean with these the very willow rose lopped every three years for fuel or powder and every sizable pine and oak or other forest tree cut down within the memory of man as if individual speculators were to be allowed to export the clouds out of the sky or the stars out of the firmament one by one we shall be reduced to gnaw the very crust of the earth for nutriment they have even descended to smaller game they have lately as i hear invented a machine for chopping up huckleberry bushes fine and so converting them into fuel bushes which for fruit alone are worth all the pear trees in the country many times over i can give you a list of the three best kinds if you want it at this rate we shall all be obliged to let our beards grow at least if only to hide the nakedness of the land and make a sylvan appearance the farmer sometimes talks of brushing up simply as if bare ground looked better than clothed ground than that which wears its natural vesture as if the wild hedges which perhaps are more to his children than his whole farm beside were dirt i know of one who deserves to be called the tree hater and perhaps to leave this for a new patronymic to his children you would think that he had been warned by an oracle that he would be killed by the fall of a tree and so was resolved to anticipate them the journalists think that they cannot say too much in favour of such improvements in husbandry it is a safe theme like piety but as for the beauty of one of these model farms i would as lief see a patent churn and a man turning it they are commonly places merely where somebody is making money it may be counterfeiting the virtue of making two blades of grass grow where only one grew before does not begin to be superhuman nevertheless it was a relief to get back to our smooth but still varied landscape for a permanent residence it seemed to me that there could be no comparison between this and the wilderness necessary as the latter is for a resource and a background the raw material of all our civilization the wilderness is simple almost to barrenness the partially cultivated country it is which chiefly has inspired and will continue to inspire the strains of poets such as compose the mass of any literature our woods are sylvan and their inhabitants woodmen and rustics that is salvagia and the inhabitants are salvages a civilized man using the word in the ordinary sense with his ideas and associations must at length pine there like a cultivated plant which clasps its fibres about a crude and undissolved mass of peat at the extreme north the voyagers are obliged to dance and act plays for employment perhaps our own woods and fields in the best wooded towns where we need not quarrel about the huckleberries with the primitive swamps scattered here and there in their midst but not prevailing over them are the perfection of parks and groves gardens arbours paths vistas and landscapes they are the natural consequence of what art and refinement we as a people have 
the common which each village possesses its true paradise in comparison with which all elaborately and wilfully wealth constructed parks and gardens are paltry imitations or i would rather say such were our groves twenty years ago the poet's commonly is not a logger's path but a woodman's the logger and pioneer have preceded him like john the baptist eaten the wild honey it may be but the locusts also banished decaying wood and the spongy mosses which feed on it and built hearths and humanized nature for him but there are spirits of a yet more liberal culture to whom no simplicity is barren there are not only stately pines but fragile flowers like the orchises commonly described as too delicate for cultivation which derive their nutriment from the crudest mass of peat these remind us that not only for strength but for beauty the poet must from time to time travel the logger's path and the indian's trail to drink at some new and more bracing fountain of the muses far in the recesses of the wilderness the kings of england formerly had their forests to hold the king's game for sport or food sometimes destroying villages to create or extend them and i think that they were impelled by a true instinct why should not we who have renounced the king's authority have our national preserves where no villages need be destroyed in which the bear and panther and some even of the hunter race may still exist and not be civilized off the face of the earth our forests not to hold the king's game merely but to hold and preserve the king himself also the lord of creation not for idle sport or food but for inspiration and our own true recreation or shall we like the villains grub them all up poaching on our own national domains end of part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine